The war in Ukraine has changed the world. And now we need to think about where this world is moving to, together. That's why Meme Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective and discover what changes should the business be ready for, before and after the victory. Every week on reinforceua.com. Доброго вечора. Я Вячеслав Покатили від імені бізнес школи Мім Київ. Вітаю вас на проекті Reinforce UA. Це проект англомовний, і всім, кому потрібен переклад, прошу натиснути кнопочку Interpretation внизу вашого екрану. Hello, dear friends. Good evening. I'm Вячеслав Покатило, and on behalf of Мім Київ Business School, welcome you on Reinforce UA project. This project was designed in order to inspire Ukrainian business community and in, invi we invited the renowned uh, world intellectual to share their view about what's going on in the world and uh, how this world is developing. Uh, the project became possible due to the general support of Bogdan Havrilishan Family Foundation, uh, 50 Thinkers Organization and um, uh, three major business uh, uh, education uh, associations, ACSB, AMBA uh, and AFMD. Um, we, uh, um, before I introduce uh, our guest today, uh, I'd like to remind you that uh, the, uh, this event is uh, recorded and will be available afterwards on different platforms. But we are online and those who join in us today uh, will be able at the end to ask questions. And for this purpose, I kindly ask you to uh, use uh, uh, Q&A button rather than chat. And now I'm honored to introduce you Ken Schmidt. Uh, uh, who will speak about uh, uh, creating demand through the customer experience. And Ken is the former communication for Harley Davidson Motor Company and played an active role in one of the most celebrated turnarounds of the corporate history. And I'm sure that if you uh, studied in any business school worldwide, uh, you should have this case uh, uh, somehow which can actually participate in. So we have a unique opportunity at the moment to see and listen to the person um, uh, whom you probably uh, had from, uh, from this uh, classical uh, Harley-Davidson case in Boston marketing and strategy. Uh, he is an author of the book, uh, Make Some Noise, Then Convenience Road to Dominance, and uh, also it was most striking. He was paid uh, to, 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 to drive motorbikes, uh, which uh, actually uh, should make uh, the life happy. And with this, uh, Ken, uh, I'm very pleased and we are very happy to have you. And uh, I, I, I give you the floor. Thank you, Slava, and thank you, everyone uh, at MIM Business School for inviting me, giving me the honor of spending some time with you today. As you can see, I'm not in an office or a working environment. I'm actually in my garage, uh, surrounded by the, the things that I love uh, in my home just outside of Washington, DC. Before I begin my presentation, I do want to say that very personally, I very much looking forward to a Ukrainian victory and an end to the aggression there so that you may all return to living the lives that you deserve. Because you do deserve it. So what I want to do is I want to talk about some things that most business people never talk about, never think about. And what you're going to notice is that a lot of what I'm going to talk about sounds very simple, maybe too simple. And a lot of times in business, we have a tendency to want to complicate things and believe that the solution to all of our problems requires a lot of complex strategies. What I'm going to talk about and share is how we as a business at Harley-Davidson Motor Company learned that we were making some very big but very common mistakes that a lot of businesses make in terms of how we approached our market, 
approached our customers and what we did for them. And it had completely changed the direction of our business. And we went from a failing company to an extraordinarily successful one. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to share my screen with you and show some photos. So please bear with me for just a moment here. Do, do, do. I'm not super good at this. There, I hope, you, I hope you can see that. That's me. You don't need to see that. What I, what I want to talk about for a minute is you have probably noticed that if you're not a member of the Harley Davidson community, that there tends to be a lot of what we call shared joy, community, delight, brotherhood, sisterhood, family that surrounds the brand. And I want to tell you that that's all intentional. That is part of Harley's business process that I will get to in a few minutes that specifically addresses the need to touch people in very human ways and in ways that people aren't accustomed to being treated by businesses. And I will tell you right away that the main goal at Harley-Davidson is not to sell motorcycles. It's not to take your money from you sell you a motorcycle and send you out on the road. The goal of Harley Davidson is to delight people by creating memorable experiences. Now, when I say experience, what I've learned is that a lot of people get nervous about, get concerned about that word because they think experience requires a large gesture requires huge investments of time and in people to do things for customers or potential customers that is going to surprise or amaze them. That's not what I'm talking about at all. The only thing a customer experience is, is what a customer remembers. And if I'm doing business with you, no matter what your business is I will remember that. I will remember what I did with your business in a positive way if you've done something to delight me, in a negative way if you did something that upset me or turned me off, or as it is with nearly all business experiences, it will be completely neutral. I won't remember anything about the time that we spent together or the time that I bought from you or did business from you because I got from you exactly what I expected, exactly what I paid for. And that's what we as business people want to move beyond. We want to move beyond simply giving people what they expect. Let's look at this. Let's look at this, though, from a different perspective. What I want you to do for just a moment and I think we all need to do this today. I want you to imagine that that's you riding a motorcycle on a beautiful day, enjoying beautiful trees. You're out in the forest riding with some of your friends and your family. And this is you. This is you operating this motorcycle, which you will begin to notice immediately if you've never done this before is that riding a motorcycle is much different than driving a car. Because on a motorcycle, you see and feel and smell everything. So you're feeling the wind, the temperature in the air. You are smelling the trees. You're smelling the farm on the left side. Of the, you're smelling everything. It's a very wonderful, glorious experience. But let me ask you a question, because you are riding this motorcycle. Where should your eyes be looking? 
And there's a reason I'm asking you this. See, most people think when they are new to riding a motorcycle that they should be looking down at the road, looking for bumps or a hole in the road or something that could you know, ruin their ride. What I want to tell you is that that's exactly what you don't want to do. Because unlike your car, a motorcycle goes where your eyes are looking. If you look to the left, the bike goes left. If you look to the right, the bike goes right. So what you want to do is you want to look, oops, see the arrow, as far up the road as possible. Because that's where you're going. That's where the bike is going to take you. There's a reason I'm telling you to look as far up the road as possible because I'm going to tie that back into your business process. We want to look as far up the road as possible. Now, there's a danger that can happen when we're riding a motorcycle if something appears suddenly. A cow walks onto the road. Now, remember what I said the motorcycle goes where your eyes are looking. So if you are looking at that cow, you're going to go right at that cow. She does not want you to do that. I don't want you to do that. It's going to scare you. It's going to scare the cow. Remember, the bike goes where your eyes go. So you want to look past the cow to see where you are going to escape to get around the cow, and both of you will go on to enjoy the rest of your day. You don't want to stare at something directly in front of you. I'm telling you this because it's very important when we get here. When we reach a part of our ride where there are a lot of very sharp, tight turns, and you can't see what's coming from the other direction. So you don't know if there's a bus or a truck or something on the road ahead, but what you want to do is you want to zip right through that turn because it feels great, it's challenging, uh, it's tremendous fun. This is what motorcycle people live for. So let's do it again. Let me ask you where your eyes should be. Should they be here where you see the blue X right in front of you? I think you know the answer. Should they be looking here at the inside of the turn? Maybe here at the outside of the turn? No. So your eyes should be here. What we say in the motorcycle community is you always want to look as far up the road as possible and look through every turn because that's where you're going to go. What I want to do, and I realize this might sound a little silly or crazy, is I want you to imagine that that sharp bend in the road, that sharp curve is a customer or someone who's very important to your business, someone that you are going to talk to today, maybe in person, maybe virtually on a Zoom, maybe on your telephone, maybe on text. You're going to talk to someone very important. What business people tend to do, and we all do this, is focus on that thing that's right in front of us. I need to have this conversation. I need to get this deal done. I need to make this sale. I need to return this customer's call and solve her problem. But what I want to tell you is you will need to change your mindset, your philosophy, and say, instead of simply doing what I'm supposed to do, instead of making this sale, answering this person's problem, interviewing this potential new employee, 
I need to think through the turn and as far up the road as possible and ask myself, what is this person that I'm about to talk to? Even if it's just on text, even if it's virtual, what do I want this person to remember and repeat, remember and tell somebody else about? Because if I'm not focused on that, I can't create a positive experience for someone. We don't simply want to give people what they want and what they expect. We need to focus on going beyond that. We need to focus on those two words that in English start with the letter R, remember and repeat. Because we have every day dozens, sometimes hundreds of opportunities to build our reputation, to build the reputation of our business, to create demand for our business by exceeding the expectations of everyone who's important to us, of saying and doing things for the people that are important to us that they remember and that they will hopefully tell somebody else about. Now, I can tell you that anywhere I go in the world, if I'm talking about motorcycles, if I'm talking about business, if I'm talking about working culture, if I'm talking about you know, the rise of technology and everything going to a virtual space instead of a live and in-person space, no matter where I am or who I'm speaking with, even people who don't like motorcycles, somebody will always say to me, I can't believe how many Harley Davidson customers have Harley Davidson's logo tattooed onto their body. What a spectacular show of customer loyalty. And I can tell you millions of people around the world have tattooed Harley Davidson's name on their bodies. Is that something you would ever consider? Is there any company you love so much that you would tattoo their name on your body? Uh, you know, McDonald's. Who would do that? It's craziness. It's, but it's amazing. And here's what people will always say. Always. I wish our customers could be as loyal as Harley Davidson's customers. But, and there's always that, but, but our product is boring. We don't do anything that's exciting or cool or iconic. Uh, what we do is invisible. You know, maybe it's software or insurance. We could never have that kind of loyalty. And to those people, I always ask this question. These people with Harley Davidson tattoos, what are they professing their loyalty to? And everyone answers that question the same way. They say, oh, they are professing their loyalty to their motorcycle, to that piece of metal, to that hardware. And I say, no, no, no. That is precisely the kind of thinking that killed our business way back in the 1980s. This belief that we existed to do something. And what we did was design, engineer, manufacture, distribute, sell, promote, and service great motorcycles. All we did was talk about what we do. And that's what most businesses do. Talk about what they do. This is what we make. This is what we sell. This is the service that we provide. And you see, that worked well for us at Harley-Davidson for years because we did not have any competition. <laughs> Nobody else, especially in North America and in Europe, were doing what we were doing, building very large, powerful, heavyweight motorcycles. But when suddenly competitors 
began to copy everything that we were doing to build motorcycles that look and perform exactly the way Harley Davidson motorcycles look and perform. Harley Davidson's market share dropped like a stone. We couldn't believe it. What happened to all those loyal customers? Where did they go? And what we learned and learned the hard way, again, is that we were promoting the wrong stuff. We were talking about what we do. We were talking about all of the benefits and values behind our product, never thinking, never realizing that our competitors were building, producing, selling, and promoting the exact same stuff. Can you think of any market in the world for any product or service where anyone is completely unique? And the answer is no. Every market is a commodity in 2023. Lots of companies doing the what appear to be the exact same thing as their competitors. The long and short of it, and if I had three hours today, I'd tell you everything that we did to make this discovery, but I will simply share the discovery with you, is again, we were selling and promoting the wrong thing. We found, we learned that human beings, you and me, we can't be made loyal to things, to objects, to products or services. What we can become loyal to is the people behind the products or things. When people are wearing that Harley Davidson tattoo, they're not saying I'm loyal to my motorcycle. They're saying I'm loyal to the people who did this for me. I'm loyal to them, these human beings, because what we learned is that we are all human, and humans humanize everything. We don't look at a business for what it does. We look at a business for who it is. Think about that. Anytime you ever describe a business, maybe it's a restaurant that you enjoy. Maybe it's a car that you like. Maybe it's a software company. If you're talking about a business, you never refer to the product, you refer to the people behind it. You say, they're great. They are a great business. They take good care of their customers. They, they, they. See, that's how human beings talk and view the world. My view of your business isn't for what your business does. My view of your business is a reflection of the culture of your business. I see you for who you are. Now, when I first started working at Harley Davidson uh, back in the mid 1980s, in 1985 to be exact, Harley Davidson was in huge trouble. Most of the workforce had been laid off. The media around the world were announcing the collapse of the company as stunning news. Here was a company that was over 80 years old that people loved. People tattooed the name on their bodies and it's going out of business because it can't compete against lower priced products. We have also had a bad reputation that came from Hollywood movies that said that we were part of criminal activity, outlaws, troublemakers always seem to be riding Harley Davidson's in the movies. And we were painted with that brush. So on my first day of work, and I was hired to improve the image of the company so that we could sell more products because we believe that we existed to sell products. And I just told you how wrong that proved to be. My first day, I wanted to get everybody on my team focused on what we needed to be doing. Uh, oh, you know what, let, let, let me go back a, a second here real quick. 
because I forgot I wanted to share this with you. I want you to take a look at human behavior for just one more second, because this is going to determine how you look at the world, okay? What you see there is a motorcycle, but what I see is a study in how we can take advantage of some very basic drivers of human behavior to create advantage. If you went to buy this motorcycle today, maybe you went to uh, Harley Davidson of Kiev, you'd spend a lot of money, but what you would do almost immediately is change the two exhaust pipes that you see coming out the back because when Harley Davidsons are built, they're very quiet. And you've probably noticed that Harley owners like to make their motorcycles loud. And the reason we make them loud is probably the best teaching tool for understanding human behavior that I've ever come across. What do all Harley riders do if we're sitting at a red light or if we're at a stop sign? I'm sure you've noticed that when Harleys aren't moving, their riders are revving their engine. Boom, boom. Why are we doing this? The reason is we're talking to you. And what we are saying to you, a child can understand. We're saying three simple words. Boom. Look at me. If you don't look, we simply make it louder. Look at me. Sooner or later, you will look, even if it's just for a second. But here's what happens. When our eyes see your eyes looking at us, we experience a momentary flash of delight. A scientist would tell you that dopamine the pleasure drug is released in our brain. And the reason we're having this little feeling of delight is because one of life's most basic human needs, a need that goes unmet for most people every day, has just been met. By looking at me, you validate me. You make me feel important special, worth looking at, worth noticing. I'm sure you notice if you walk up or down the street or walk into a business your entire life, people don't get all excited to see you come in, right? You're just another customer, another person. But when you look at us on the bike, we get that little release of joy because it feels good to us. Now, let me ask you a question because this is the fundamental question of business and life. What do we do as human beings to any source of delight in our lives? And the answer is we, we return to it faithfully until it fails to delight us. And what I just did was define the word loyalty. We will return to, we will seek out anything that we know delights us because it makes us feel good. And we will continue to do that until it stops delighting us, which is why every motorcycle person on a Harley is still revving his engine at every red light or stop sign that he or she will ever stop at. Let's go just a tiny bit deeper into the why. What is the first thing that this person just said to you? And the first thing that he said to you is not, I sure do like Harley Davidson. The first thing he said to you, again, those three words, look at me, notice me, react to me. I did not put all of this ink on my head to be artistic and make a statement. I did it so that I will no longer be invisible, so that you will look at me. And why do I want you to look at me? 
And the answer is because I view myself as the most important human being in the universe. I see myself as the most important person in the universe. And people say, that's rude that somebody believes that they are the center of the universe and that the entire world revolves around them. And I say, no, it's accurate because we all see ourselves that way. Every thought you will ever have in your life, every feeling, every emotion, everything that you ever see, experience, or hear is felt and heard and experienced, right? And remembered relative to how it impacts me, the center of the universe. But what do most businesses do when they meet new clients or a potential new client or a new employee? Businesses immediately begin to talk about the business. Let me tell you what we do here and why we're different. Forgetting that the person we're talking to sees himself or herself as the center of the universe. And they're wondering, why am I not being asked to speak? Why are you not asking me questions about me? Why are you not allowing me to tell you all about myself and to bask in the glory of my amazing presence? See, why does Facebook exist or Instagram or whatever social media platforms are out there? They exist to fill a hole in human existence. We are so desperate as a species for validation, to have opportunities to talk about ourselves. Our favorite topic of discussion is always ourselves. We're so desperate to talk about ourselves and have other humans react to it that we have to go to the false digital world to make that happen. So when one of your friends on Facebook puts up a exciting photo about her new dog, what is she really saying? She's saying, somebody, please give me one of these. Give me one of these, right? Respond to me in a positive way. And if you're having a weak moment, you hit that thumb up or that heart. What happens inside that new dog owner's brain when she sees people giving her post a thumb up or a heart? Dopamine is released. Somebody reacted to me. That feels great. So what do we do to any source of delight in our lives? We return to it until it fails to delight us. And that explains why so many people are so addicted to social media and can't get their face away from their phone because it's the only source of validation that they have. So what that tells us is a business and what it instructs us to do at Harley Davidson is if we know people are hungry to feel good about themselves, to be validated, why shouldn't we be the people who do that? And we change the mindset and the philosophy of our business away from building and selling motorcycles to serving as a source of delight for people. If we delight people first, it's much easier to sell motorcycles, to sell leather jackets, to sell boots, to sell service. At the end of the day, Harley Davidson can't sell you anything that you cannot get from any other motorcycle manufacturer in the world. We all do the exact same thing, build motorcycles that go forward. We could either try to differentiate ourselves with our products and services like everybody else does, or we could serve as a delight for people because we know when we do that, they come back and they bring their friends with them. Imagine if you went to buy a TV today, a television, and you either shopped online or you went to 
electronic store. What you would see are an awful lot of TVs that look virtually identical to each other. And this is a great metaphor for the business world. No matter what you're buying, there are a lot of companies selling the same thing. And these are all priced the same. Say it's you know, 8,000 uh, Vribnia, if I pronounce that right. You can't see any difference in the products, so you look at the name brand on the bottom. The name brand is supposed to tell us something, and I'm now going to show you a bunch of name brands. Are there any of these you would be embarrassed to own? And the answer is no, because you know they all work well. They're made by large companies that are famous, right? And that are known for making good products. Which one are you going to buy? You're going to buy the one that's on sale today, the one with the reduced price. And you will take it home and you're going to plug it in and watch Servant of the People, and it's going to work perfectly as it was designed to do. You won't tell anybody about it. You're not going to go brag about it. You didn't have any kind of experience other than getting what you paid for. That's what we as business people need to learn to move beyond. Because these TVs, you know, less than 10 years ago, cost 50%, 75% more than they do now. But now they practically have to give them away because there's no marketplace preference for any particular brand. So now back to on my first day of work at Harley, I wanted to get our people focused on not selling the product and building the image of the company. So I typed out, I was actually using a typewriter then, the three questions that you see right there. What are people saying? What do we want them to say about us? And what are we doing to get them to say it? And what we're talking about here is saying, look, if we're going to build our reputation as a business and create demand for what we do, we need to be saying and doing things in front of the people that we serve that they're going to remember and tell others about. And we're going to do that by focusing on who we are instead of what we do. In our dealerships around the country and around the world, we changed our focus from selling motorcycles to creating memorable moments for people, making them feel welcome, wanted doing and saying things in front of them that we know or certainly hope that they're going to remember, tell somebody else about and come back for more. Let me give you just a quick example. This is a new bike demonstration that's happening where People who don't own a Harley Davidson motorcycle or an older one can come and ride a brand new bike for 25 or 30 kilometers and have a good time. The gentleman on the left is going to have maybe one minute to talk with this woman before she takes off and then and the next bike pulls up. Rather than doing what most businesses would do in front of a new customer and try to tell her all about the product as quickly as possible, oh, you're going to enjoy the 1850cc motor that's pushing 61 pounds of torque to the rear wheel at 3,500 RPM, right? That's motorcycle talk, but she's not going to remember any of that. Nobody would. We learned that the hard way. He knows his job is to be a source of delight for her and say and do things that she will remember and repeat. So he's saying to her, give me your phone quick. And she's giving her, giving him her phone. And he's going to walk around and take some pictures of her while she's on the bike. And while he's doing that, he's going to ask her questions about her favorite topic of discussion, herself. Tell me about yourself. Tell me about your family. What do, you, what do you enjoy doing on the weekend? He's going to give her her phone back, and she'll ride away. 
We know that when she is back at home with her friends or when she's at work on Monday, that she's going to be showing those photos to her friends and say, I went and rode a brand new Harley Davidson motorcycle. Those people are cool. I like them. They made me feel good. They did such a great job for me. We had so much fun. Mission accomplished. We don't want her to fall in love with the idea of buying the product. We want her to like us, period. If she likes us a little bit more than she likes BMW or Ducati or Triumph or Honda or Yamaha or Kawasaki or Suzuki, we win. This is a lookalike market where the importance of success is being the more likable, more human business. This is Virgil. And Virgil is one of my favorite Harley dealers in the world. And the reason he's my favorite is he does a spectacular job of describing what he does. He owns a motorcycle dealership in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And I say, Virgil, what's your job? And he, say, he will say, and he would say it to you, I am 100% responsible for what people who live in my community Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, say and believe to be true about me, this business, the people who work here, what we do here, and who we do it for. Nobody else can do that except me. That is my job as the leader of this dealership, to create an environment that's focused on delighting people, making people feel welcome, wanted, appreciated looking excited and joyfully passionate when they walk in the door. Because we know passion is a instantly mimicked behavior. When you're around somebody who looks like they're having the best time of their life, you begin to imitate that person because we're a joy-seeking species. What do the people that you serve, what do the people who are important to you, perhaps the boss at your company, the owner of your company, a customer or a prospective customer. When somebody's talking about you, what are they saying? What do you want them to say? And what are you doing to get them to say it? I'm going to open this to questions in just a moment. But again, I just want to repeat and reiterate my love, my concern, my prayers, my support for you and everyone in the Ukraine. I want this over. I'm sure nowhere near as much as you do, but your victory will be one of the greatest days in world history. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, it was uh, a great uh, uh, possibility to, to listen to a person who uh, participated and worked uh, uh, this great uh, case of, uh, let's say, formally, um, let's say, professor's work, differentiation case of uh, of uh, making the uh, the product uh, uh, really loud in all sense. Yes. Uh, but if you would mind, I have a few not an easy questions in my opinion. Uh, you wrote the book about loudness, uh, uh, and 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 Harley Davidson is a great example of a really loud company, loud in sense that. You are not even Harley Davidson, not even in the 10 biggest manufacturers of bikes. But everybody knows, uh, everybody knows Harley Davidson worldwide. I can't imagine a person who uh, doesn't know what Harley Davidson is and, uh, and, and the ideas, they have their own ideas what it is, but they know. Uh, why then? Harley Davidson, in terms of amount of bikes sold, are not very successful in other countries than US, I don't know, Canada, etc. Looks and figures. So I checked figures. Mm -hmm. So you 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 still sell two set of all production in the US. It is big world. It is a world which is easily accessible. Mm -hmm. What, in your opinion, is the reason of this? Uh, that's a very good question and a very fair question. Uh, 
First of all, uh, Harley Davidson is a 120 year old company. It has been exporting motorcycles to other countries since uh, the First World War. So the Harley's had a large global footprint. However, Harley Davidson has maintained a product split division of keeping 80% of motorcycles in North America and exporting to other markets the other 20%. That may vary a little bit by country every year, but there are only so many bikes that can be made and shipped and sold. And if there are too many bikes that are built and shipped, that pushes the value down. So it's a, there is always some value in scarcity of product. Also, from a market share perspective, Harley Davidson's are very expensive. It's a premium price. It's the premium price that's built on delivering that great experience for people. You can ride any motorcycle and have fun. Any motorcycle, they're all really well done. But if you want to be part of this social network of motorcyclists around the world, if you want to wear the jacket, feel like you're part of something bigger, you pay more for that. Uh, all throughout Europe, Africa, Asia, there are way, way, way more affordable motorcycles to ride than Harley Davidson's. Honda out of Japan will build more motorcycles in one morning than Harley Davidson will sell in a year. But very few of them are large motorcycles. They're very small. You know, motorcycles made for cheap transportation. Harley Davidson doesn't play in that world. Harley only plays in the premium high end segment, like a Porsche, an Audi, uh, you know, BMWs, Lamborghinis. Y you pay more for that experience than for the actual hardware. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, another question is. Uh... It's not the surprise, and it actually goes from the polls uh, that uh, people at the moment uh, trust more business than uh, uh, than than government. Uh, so, in the Harley Davidson, in particular, the company which is built on this trust and this uh, uh, some kind of a dedication uh, um, to 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 idea. Uh, to to memory as you as you mentioned etc uh, and you worked as a communication director of such a company and you live in the us which is currently you know is shaking from all kind of discussions uh, at least from from outside if i look at yes. outside all kind of discussion of very difficult sensitive issues i would not mention uh, this kind to what extent in your opinion uh, uh, managers or uh, representatives of the such a great company with such a trust like Harry Davidson should somehow enter into these discussions and and participate uh, I I know this is not an easy question in cases but but uh, your opinion is very is very interesting it is always my belief that if you have a strong position as a business it's your obligation to share that position with the world so what i mean by that is to your question businesses tend to be very uh what we call tight-lipped very quiet don't want to discuss anything that might be controversial and of course harley davidson does that too but when there are issues that mean a lot to people uh when wars break out when the economy has collapsed in the in the u.s what harley davidson has typically done is buy full page ads in major newspapers they say there's never been a better time to ride than right now you need to clear your mind you need to be able to focus on what's important you need to get back to what makes you feel good about yourself there's going to be problems and always will be we are here to be the antidote to that. Get on a motorcycle and ride and all of those problems become much smaller. 
And that's always been the company's position. Thank you. Uh, Aleona from, uh, uh, from our audience asks you, what is your experience or advice you can give uh, in, uh, in, to start own business? To start your own business? Yeah. Uh, first what, of all, what you would advise to a person who wants to start own business? Yes. Uh, first of all, I'm proud of anybody that starts their own business, and I encourage you to do that. But what I would say first and foremost, if you're starting a business, even if you're working at a business that's been around 100 years, is answer the three questions that I had typed out. What are people saying? What do I want people to say about my business? And what do I have to do to make that happen? And remember, when people talk about a business, they're talking about your new business that you're starting, no matter what it is, they aren't going to be talking about specifically what you do, right? They're not going to use words like quality and commitment to customer satisfaction. Right. What they're going to be talking about is you. So how do you wish to be remembered? What are the words that you would want people to use? I'll give you a quick example. As we learned that all we were always talking about our quality, our craftsmanship, our engineering. And the problem with that was that all of our competitors were doing that, too, because that's what everybody does. So we said, the more we talk that way, the more we sound like our competitors. We need to break away from that. So we created a new vocabulary for our business, where instead of talking about selling motorcycles, we talk about promoting freedom, the freedom to be your own person, to stand out, to make some noise, to have fun. We talk about passion, the camaraderie, the opportunity to get together with like-minded people uh, and individuality to express yourself because those are the words that people remember and use when they talk about our business. And they use those words because we do every time we talk to somebody. Ali Davidson entered electrical market all this you know trend uh, to to move to 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 electrical uh, vehicles and then particularly you already start selling this electrical market is the question is uh, um, how to make them loud in this uh, uh, <laughs> currently situation I'm not technically loud I, I understand how technically make it loud I, I I did it even with my bicycle when, when I was uh, six or seven uh, uh, but but uh, how to make loud and continue with this passion, you, you, you wonderful words, passion with electrical yeah. bikes, because it's already not, it's different. <laughs> Some of that, that is a very timely question because when Harley Davidson first began to develop electrical motorcycles, that was the first comment people had is how can you make it loud so that other people will, will hear you coming? And you know, Harley tried uh, and tested some different technologies that would allow the bike, the electric bike to make a noise, but that came across as very fake, artificial. So then what we determined correctly was that riders on electric bikes when the bike isn't making a noise, it's up to them, it's up to the rider to stand out. So instead of wearing a lot of black leather the way traditional Harley riders do, what you see is the people on electric bikes wearing a lot of bright orange, bright yellow, loud helmets with artwork on them so that they stand out and get noticed so that they're not invisible. So riders will always find a way to make noise even if you can't necessarily hear it because that's part of what uh, riding a Harley Davidson is, about being noticed. A wonderful idea, but did this idea come from, uh, from, from bottom or, or you actually invented it and, and, and somehow promoted it? As the company was 
allowing people to take demonstration rides on the bikes. They were all saying the same thing. This is a fantastic new toy, fantastic new motorcycle, but it's too quiet. And if I'm going to pay the price to own a Harley Davidson electric motorcycle versus another one, I need to be able to, to stand out. I need to be recognized and seen. And that's what started the discussion about uh, clothing and colors and things that allow the riders to stand out. In addition, people that are buying the electric motorcycles are doing a lot to, uh, to customize the vehicle with different colors, graphics, again, just things that allow it to stand out. There is no doubt, no doubt whatsoever that the world is going to continue to tilt away from traditional gasoline powered motorcycles to electric just as surely as they are with cars. So it, it is going to be a big curve to get over, but I would imagine that 10 years from now, we wouldn't be having this discussion because everyone will be, be so accustomed to seeing the electric vehicles. Um, I looked at the statistics uh, uh, before this, 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 uh, this evening and found that um, uh, the registration and the uh, sales of motorbikes in the US uh, actually twice less than it used to be before 2008. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's got some, kind of, some kind of a stable, a little bit growing, but it, it's more or less a stable, but considerably less. And there was a, some a pike in uh, b b before this this financial crisis, but more or less the, the market sub substantially lower. Uh, is there any reason for this? Uh, yes. uh, I mean, I mean, demographic, economic, uh, social, uh, what? Uh, work? You you uh, could argue that it is demographic. And a lot of people do, especially people in the investment community, say that, that, that the product is too skewed toward older people, people that are older, people that are in their 50s or 60s. Uh, but it, that's, it, that's always been the case with Harley Davidson. It's an expensive product. But what we also need to remember is that during the 1990s, which was the big boom era for Harley Davidson, the global economy, and especially the American economy was absolutely booming. People had money to spend after the 1980s and coming out of recession. Uh, people had money to spend and were spending it. So buying homes, buying toys, buying motorcycles. And Harley was increasing its production all through the 90s and into the early 2000s. The one thing that is interesting that works against Harley Davidson is that these bikes do not disappear. Okay, this, this bike behind you, that's 40 years old. I have ones behind it that are brand new, but you can't tell the difference looking at them, how old they are. They, they do not age and fall apart and end up in a, in a junkyard somewhere. So just the sheer volume of Harley Davidson's in the marketplace went from low hundreds of thousands in the early 1990s into the many millions by 2010. And they're all still here. They're all still registered. They haven't gone away. So people who want Harleys uh, are more than happy to buy a used one because Harley riders maintain their bikes very well and keep them beautiful. Uh, so that, that is, it, it's harder to convince somebody to buy a Harley Davidson when, when they know that they can get a used one uh, that looks just as good and have just as much fun on it. So th it is a challenge and Harley wishes <laughs> that the business could get back to what it was in the early 2000s where people were lined up, lined up around the block to come into the dealerships to buy a new bike. Uh, we have probably a minute for, for the last question. I'd like to ask uh, some kind of personal. Yeah. Um, what, what are you doing in, I mean, in your life? You know, how does your life look like uh, additionally to, to write in and, and talking uh, to people, progressing yourself, 
what, what what do you like more most let's say and uh, when when do you enjoy yourself um, and um, believe that's uh, that, that that's a great time i enjoy and thank you for for asking i enjoy life <laughs> A lot. I, I do a lot of speaking to business groups and to colleges around the world, which I love doing because it gives me an excuse to ride motorcycles in cities or in countries that I've never been to before. So I, I, I very much enjoy doing that. I also do uh, consulting to businesses of all sizes, businesses that want to learn how to improve their competitiveness. How do we change how we position ourselves in the market? I have a tremendous passion for doing that. I enjoy it very much because I learned how to do this and how to make it work and how to make it successful with other businesses. That's fun for me, but I also love uh, football, American football. I love soccer, European and global football. I enjoy baseball, basketball, sports, fishing, hunting, and traveling. All those things. All the things. Enjoy your life. Uh, again, it was a great pleasure to, to have you with us. And uh, I do believe and hope that the, the day will come and you will be able to visit Ukraine. Um, uh, and we shall, uh, like a business school, will be pleased to, to have you talking. But also, uh, I'm sure that a lot of friends uh, in Ukraine and in Kiev will be pleased to ride with you on the streets on, on Kiev with, uh, with Harley Davidson's. Um, uh, and with this, uh, 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 we shall end this uh, particular session. And I remind you that the video will be available afterwards in different platforms, in particular on these sites. Uh, and uh, please advise uh, uh, your colleagues and friends uh, to, to come back and to look. And we will use this uh, as a teaching material as well, because it's a classical case. And it is really a pleasure to have somebody uh, who, who knows it fr from, from uh, within. And uh, what is left is just to remind our participant that our project is going on uh, and the next meeting will be in two weeks on the 10th of May, uh, starting at 6 p.m. in Kiev. And our guest will be Petros Paranikas, um, to some extent also related to, to the case because uh, he used to work for quite a long in BCG, Boston Consulting Group. I would actually was an, one of the horses behind, behind the, making the, uh, the teaching case available worldwide and other, other professors need. And he will be talking also very practical things about how to negotiate with powerful suppliers. Um, um, and uh, uh, we are looking forward to, to have uh, um, uh, uh, Dr. Paranikas with us uh, uh, on the 10th of May. And with this, uh, Ken, once again, uh, it was an honor and a great pleasure to have you with us. And we are looking forward uh, for your coming. Uh, and we are sure that we will win um, uh, this uh, fight uh, uh, and uh, also appreciate uh, that Harley Davidson was among the first companies uh, who withdraw all operations uh, from Russia, despite the business was not bad there as far as I could gather. Um, so uh, take care, Slava Ukraini, and, uh, and uh, uh, goodbye. Thank you and goodbye. The war in Ukraine has changed the world. And now we need to think about where this world is moving to, together. That's why Meme Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective and discover what changes should the business be ready for before and after the victory. Every week on ReinforceUA.com